Now, nephrotic syndrome is a completely different entity. One of the main differences between nephrotic and nephritic is that the nephrotic syndromes are not an inflammatory process. Now, what do you think this means? Well, this means that there's usually no fever and no hematuria in nephrotic syndrome. Instead, there's massive protein found in the urine, greater than 3.5 grams a day. There's also hyperlipidemia and severe clinical edema along with an increased risk for thromboembolic events due to the urination of antithrombin-3. There's also an increased risk of infection due to urination of immunoglobulins. Let's start with focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, also known as FSGS. Now just looking at the name, what percentage of the glomeruli will be involved? We can tell that it's less than 50% because it's focal. And because it's segmental, only parts of the glomeruli are sclerosed, meaning they look scarred. The immunofluorescence is nonspecific, and on electron microscopy, the foot processes of the podocyte are effaced, meaning that the normally spaced foot processes with their little grooves between them disappear. FSGS is a common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults, and is the most common glomerular disease in African Americans, Hispanics, and HIV patients. And there's usually an inconsistent response to steroid treatment. Now that we've talked about the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults, let's talk about minimal change disease, which is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in kids. Will you see anything abnormal on light microscopy? No, you won't see anything abnormal, and that's why it's called minimal change disease. The immunofluorescence is also negative. On electron microscopy, the foot processes of the podocyte become effaced, which leads to a disruption of the normal glomerular filtration barrier. Look at the image in the bottom right to see how the normal pattern of the foot processes is being replaced by a blobby foot process without the normal filtration slits. These foot processes have basically just fused together. There's no longer a filtration barrier. How do you think this might affect the kidney's ability to retain albumin? Well, it'll be decreased. This protein will be directly lost into the urine and will contribute to the patient's symptoms. Now, this disease often follows an infection, immunization, some immune stimulus, or can be associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Typically, there's an excellent response to steroids. Next is membranous nephropathy. Now, this one is a bit more complicated. The common histologic findings include capillary and glomerular basement membrane thickening on light microscopy. Notice that this time the glomerulus is completely involved. There is a granular pattern on immunofluorescence due to immune complex deposition. Do you remember what sort of pattern this causes on electron microscopy? Remember that it causes a spike in dome appearance on electron microscopy marked by sub-epithelial deposits. It's the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in Caucasian adults. Patients may have autoantibodies to the phospholipase A2 receptor. It can also be caused by a number of drugs, infections, lupus, and even cancers. It responds poorly to steroids. Next on the list is amyloidosis. Now this is a systemic disease process and the kidneys are the most commonly involved organ. Now what's the classic stain used to pick up amyloid on light microscopy? This is the Congo red stain. And how will the amyloid present on imaging? It will appear as apple green birefringence. Now these are two very high yield terms and are most always associated with amyloid deposition on the exam. It's associated with chronic conditions such as multiple myeloma, tuberculosis, and rheumatoid arthritis. Finally, let's take a minute to discuss diabetic glomerulonephropathy. What's the most common cause of chronic kidney disease in the United States? Diabetes. Now, what's the most common cause of dialysis in the United States? You guessed it, diabetes. This disease is crazy prevalent and therefore often tested on any exam you'll take throughout your medical careers. It results from high blood glucose leading to non-enzymatic glycosylation of the glomerular basement membrane and efferent arterioles, which basically just means glucose molecules start binding to proteins in the basement membrane and efferent arterioles. Now how will this affect the basement membrane and mesangium? Well, the glomerular basement membrane will thicken while the mesangium will expand. These changes contribute to the pathognomonic pathologic finding of diabetic kidney disease the Kimmel-Steele-Wilson lesion, which is the diffuse pink glomerulus that looks like a nodule.
As we can see here in this image, there are acellular ovoid nodules here in the periphery of the glomerulus. These are the classic chemosteel wilson nodules seen in this disease and should always point you towards a diagnosis of diabetic glomerulonephropathy. Also, you can appreciate the diffuse thickening of the basement membrane, which will aid you in your diagnosis of a diabetic process. Here we can see the diffuse thickening of the basement membrane. The disease results in an increased glomerular permeability and constriction of the efferent arterioles. This will increase the GFR, which further increases urine production in these patients, in addition to the glucose that osmotically pulls water into the urine. So this is why diabetic patients urinate so much. Do you remember what test the primary care physician might want to order to screen for early diabetic nephropathy? The answer is urine microalbumin. Tiny amounts of albumin will leak out into the urine once the glomerulus starts to weaken. Alright, now let's tie in some pharmacology. What medication do you want to put your diabetic patients on to protect the kidneys of your diabetics? Absolutely, an ACE inhibitor. Now that we've gone through some details about nephrotic syndrome, let's see how prepared we are to answer questions that might come up on your exam. A six-year-old boy presents your office complaining of swollen legs. On exam, he has diffuse edema bilaterally. His mother tells you that he had a bad sore throat a few weeks ago, but the doctor gave him a medicine she can't recall, and it went away after a few days. A 24-hour urine test reveals 5.5 grams of protein. What is the most likely cause of this boy's edema? Answer. Minimal change disease. Now I know what you're thinking. That throat infection sounds a lot like strep throat, so this has to be post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. But if you just remember the difference between nephritic and nephrotic, you'll see why this can't be the case. First of all, since post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is nephritic, you would expect to see some fever and hematuria with the edema. But, more importantly, the patient has proteinuria of 5.5 grams per day. So this is more than 3.5 that's the cutoff limit, and it's more consistent with a nephrotic syndrome. Since this is a child and it's happening after an infection, the most likely cause is minimal change disease. Now let's move on to some pathologies that don't affect the glomeruli directly. The first one to discuss is kidney stones, also called nephrolithiasis. This results from precipitation of some kind of crystal in the collecting system of the kidneys, and it can lead to other complications. Can you name some of these? Well, one complication that can result is hydronephrosis, which is atrophy of the renal tissue due to compression by the urine that cannot flow out. It occurs when urinary outflow is obstructed, like by a stone, which causes urine to back up. Another complication is pyelonephritis, because less urine flow makes it easier for bacteria to establish infections that can move up to the kidney. How will a kidney stone present on physical exam? Kidney stones present with unilateral flank pain that radiates to the groin, because usually patients only have a kidney stone on one side. There will also be hematuria. Will there be red blood cell casts? Well, no, because the problem is occurring after the renal tubules, so the red blood cells will not be able to form casts. There are different treatments for different types of stones, but all patients should be encouraged to increase their fluid intake so that they don't precipitate more kidney stones. There are four kinds of kidney stones, each with its own special characteristics. By far, the most common are calcium-containing stones, either calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, or both. For calcium oxalate stones, they appear pretty similar to the back of an envelope. Take a look at the image in your book and keep that in the back of your head come test day, since a microscopic image may show up. They occur more in conditions associated with hypercalciuria. Ingestion of ethylene glycol leads to calcium oxalate formation, because ethylene glycol is metabolized to oxalic acid. Vitamin C causes increased urinary excretion of oxalate, leading to calcium oxalate stone formation. Now why is there increased calcium oxalate stone formation in Crohn's disease patients? Because they have fat malabsorption. The fat stays in the small intestines and binds to calcium. Therefore, calcium cannot bind to oxalate, and the oxalate gets absorbed. This leads to calcium oxalate precipitation in the urine. It's helpful to remember that calcium phosphate precipitates in an increased pH, and calcium oxalate precipitates in a decreased pH. Treatment includes thiazides, which do what to calcium excretion? Well, they reduce it. Another treatment is citrate, which binds calcium to prevent its precipitation in the urine. 
Both calcium phosphate and calcium oxalate stones are radio-opaque, so they are easily seen on x-ray or CT. The next type of stone is the ammonium-magnesium phosphate stone, also known as the struvite stone. These occur when the urine pH is abnormally high, like during infections with urease-positive bacteria, which break down urea to produce ammonia. The usual culprits are Proteus mirabilis, Staphylococcus, and Klebsiella. The staghorn calculite can be massive and can become anitis for UTIs. Treatments include antibiotics for the infection and surgical removal of the stone. As seen here in this x-ray, they are radio-opaque. The stones themselves kind of look like the top of a coffin lid. You can remember their association with ammonium magnesium because you can trace out a capital M in the lid of a coffin. Next is uric acid stones. These occur in conditions that increase uric acid excretion, such as gout or leukemia, where there is an increased cell turnover in uric acid production due to purine metabolism. Risk factors include anything that will decrease urine volume and make the urine more acidic, such as an arid climate. These stones are special because they are radiolucent, meaning that they cannot be seen on an x-ray. However, they can still be seen with ultrasound and CT. On microscopy, these stones look rhomboid in appearance. We treat these by alkalinizing the urine. Finally, there are cysteine stones, which are pretty rare, but can occur in the context of genetic cystinuria, so it's most often seen in children. These can also form staghorn calculi. The sodium nitroprusside test will be positive for urine containing cysteine. On microscopy, these stones appear hexagonal in shape. These stones are radio-opaque and precipitate in a decreased pH. Therefore, we treat by alkalinizing the urine. Flash quiz. A man has flank pain and hematuria. X-ray detects no kidney stones. Urinalysis shows acidic urine and crystals. Which kidney stone is this? This is a uric acid kidney stone. The giveaway here is that the stones are radiolucent, so we know that it's a uric acid stone. The acidic pH also supports uric acid stones because uric acid stones precipitate in a decreased pH.